I'm not in the center, am I? Okay, okay. Let's slide to the center. Can they see you right there? Can you guys see Holly? Yeah, just your head. Okay, all right, stay out of trouble. All right, or I will put you inside. Welcome to HeartTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do on Sundays. Shooting this video a little bit early because I'm uh, heading up to a uh, trade show, uh, the first of the week, um, one of several uh, things that I have going on over the next couple of months like that. Uh, stay out of that bed. Uh, and I needed to shoot this early, so it's about three days. Uh, shooting this on like Thursday or something like that. You'll see it on Sunday. Uh, I had the, I did two giveaways there in December for uh, consultations, which are linked down below uh, all of the videos. If you're interested in getting a consultation sometime this spring, I'm going to do a third one sometime in January. So pro probably on next Sunday's q and I'll announce that. And it will have something to do with the new channel, the Garden Plants with Jim Putnam channel. Um, I have shot several more videos that should go up in the next few days. And uh, so uh, it'll be associated with that somehow next week. But I'll announce that next week. Uh, the person who won last week and I announced their name, I saw they commented at the bottom of the video and then said they were sending me an email. I don't think I got that email. If I did, it, I haven't seen it. So send another one if you haven't. Um, you know who you are. Um, let's see. Uh, we can get started on some questions here uh, from last week. Uh, somebody said they had yellow leaves on their newly planted azaleas. I have three azaleas directly behind me and they have uh, they have some yellow leaves on them. And then I have several in the yard this year that have a lot of yellow leaves on them. I think it was so dry this fall. I didn't pay enough attention to it. They always lose leaves this time of year. Azaleas, despite being evergreen, lose a good portion of their leaves during throughout the winter time and put on new growth um, after they flower in the spring. So it's not abnormal to have yellow leaves on them now. It's abnormal to have as many as we have on some of them though. And that's because it was so dry this fall. Newly planted uh, is basically the same thing because you did some root damage when you put them in the ground. That root damage was enough to probably prevent it from getting enough water to the top even if you were adequately watering them. So that's why it's a little worse on your newly planted ones. It's no big deal. They'll bloom in the spring. If they're, if they get really thin after they bloom in the spring, you could give them a bit of a haircut and that would encourage some interior growth to kind of fill some of that back in. But keep in mind, if we're having a dry fall, frequently here in the South, we have fairly dry falls. It's the only time of the year it's actually dry uh, or predictably dry. Um, then give them some extra water. And I, again, I didn't do that to my own. Um, Somebody have their, their blueberries are blooming in East Texas and uh, wanted to know whether they have blueberries. Depends on how many of the flowers are opening. I mean, obviously the ones that are fully opened are probably pretty doubtful, but there may be some residual flower buds on there that haven't swollen and opened. So you may get, you may still get blueberries, but it'll be less. Uh, definitely, um, uh, we use, we plant blueberries based on chill hours that you receive. And I don't know in East Texas um, where you're at, how many chill hours you typically have, but we need to buy blueberries that kind of match the number of chill hours uh, that you receive. And uh, you know, so there's different blueberries for each of us as we go north. But the chill hour system, unfortunately, has become broken. Um, it was a bit more predictable, and now it seems like, uh, seems like it doesn't work as well uh, anymore. I've got some of my best performing blueberries now are some southern high bush varieties that only require about 200 chill hours. Uh, it makes no sense. My, I should need blueberries that require like 400 to 600 chill hours. But the last few winters, again, my Florida, my, my University of Florida uh, blueberries that I thought would just be more decorative than anything else. I didn't think I'd get enough chill hours on them uh, have been my best performing ones. And so the chill hour system for blueberries isn't working as well as it should. Uh, Another thing is, I think there's probably some mislabeling going on too in blueberries. So even if the chill hours thing is working properly, uh, sometimes I think that um, they're hard to tell apart. And so I think there could be some mix-ups in, uh, in labeling. And so you could have a variety like uh, Misty that requires, you know, very low chill hours uh, mixed, with, you know, into another group that requires four or five, six hundred uh, chill hours and they just get mixed up in the trade potentially. I don't know if that's, you know, don't know if that's, uh, you know, a possibility as well, but I, I think you'll still get some, but it will be less. Um, and, uh, I hope this is, 
you know, just a trend, you know, where we see peaches and apples and everything leafing out, you know, flowering in December and January every year, everywhere. Um, I, I don't know. I just don't know. Um, somebody asked me if I use straight compost in my vegetable garden. Um, initially, the first, when I first started that vegetable garden over there, and it's been in, it was in my monthly uh, checklist video that will, you will have seen before this if you want to see the vegetable garden over there. Um, initially, I tilled compost into that existing soil, and since then, I've added a little bit of compost to the top of it each time. That compost just gets mixed in when I plant the plants. And so, no, it's not in straight compost, and I don't like to use straight compost because uh, soil is rock dust, and rock dust contains minerals, and I want the plants to have more minerals. I think if you're using straight compost, um, they won't necessarily get everything they need out of that. You know, you have to you have to fertilize to, to, to compensate uh, for some of that. So I want some rock dust or so, you know, actual soil uh, mixed in with that, uh, um, mixed in with that compost for that reason. So uh, no, it's not straight compost, but it is a lot of compost. Okay, somebody asked if you can kill Bermuda without glyphosate. Probably no, um, uh, you know, if you dig it out, unfortunately, then you turn up the soil and you have additional weed seeds. Um, I've tried to cover Bermuda grass with plastic, and you can cover it for sometimes as much as a month or two and uncover it, and it's yellow, and within a couple of days, some of it comes back. So uh, you can try that, just bare, you know, covering it in boxes or paper or, uh, you know, or a piece of plastic that you can move from spot to spot. Uh, and just try to cook it and kill some of it that way. But I think at the end of the day, um, if I was going to use glyphosate for anything, it would be to to get rid of a Bermuda uh, grass area. Um, not you know got you know if you've watched my channel for any length of time, um, I am not a chemical person. And I'm trying to get you guys to improve your soils and things, which you know is your best defense. Healthy plants are your best defense against having to spray uh, fungicides, insecticides. Um, but in the case of Bermuda grass coming from your neighbors um, and, and creeping into your space or wanting to kill back a Bermuda grass area so that you can plant and start growing other things, you know, that's probably the proper use for glyphosate um, if we're going to use it. Okay, um, somebody asked me, I'll get negativity about that, but that, that's life. <laughs> that's, that's life. Trust me, you've eaten a lot of glyphosate in the last two weeks, probably, from all the corn and everything else that, you know, glyphosate gets spread on. Um, I don't think glyphosate was that big of a deal, or Roundup, was that big of a deal before we started using it in industrial farming. Before that, it was just, it had limited use. It was, you know, people killing a few weeds here and a few weeds there, and who, how, what was the big deal? Now we cover, you know, 20% of the country in it by airplane. It's, it's completely nuts. Uh, let's see. Um, somebody asked me, I had mentioned a while back that I was going to start covering some uh, uh, coffee shops in these Q&As while, while I was traveling. And, um, and of course, I forget that when I go to, you know, a lot of the places I go to. But I was in St. Augustine a few weeks back. And anytime I'm down in St. Augustine, Florida, I go to Kookaburra uh, Coffee. There's one in St. Augustine, and then there's one a little south of St. Augustine in, in St. Augustine Beach. Um, those are pretty good uh, coffee places, and I, uh, I frequent both of them when I'm in that part of Florida. Okay, um, somebody asked me about hiring a good landscaper. This is a great question. Um, I'm a North Carolina certified landscape contractor. Uh, in order to earn that certification, uh, I, uh, I, my classwork that I had taken in horticulture, my time spent working for um, a garden center and landscaper and my time spent working for a landscape contractor. I had to work for another landscape contractor and have experience under one of them for a while. And then uh, there's three parts to the testing, a plant ID test, a general horticulture test, which honestly any of you could pass right this minute. It was embarrassingly easy, honestly. Um, and uh, a third part that was like a, a site plan uh, a group of questions related to a, uh, a landscape uh, plan um, drawn by a landscape architect, and it was just estimations of materials uh, for that. So that was the three parts to that exam. So anyway, it was fairly thorough that led me to be a North Carolina certified landscape contractor. What does it mean? It means nothing. 
means absolutely nothing. No one in the state of North Carolina knows what a North Carolina certified landscape contractor is except for us. Anybody else can call themselves a landscaper. If you own a pickup and a shovel, you're a landscaper. Uh, it makes no sense. <laughs> it makes absolutely no sense. What we actually need is the North Carolina certified landscape contractor exam that I went through as a high level. And we actually probably need some sort of other certification that's uh, below that, that at least allows for some professionalism um, so that you, you know that that person has, again, passed something. Uh, because there is, there are a lot of people. I call them landscapers in training. I had a ton of them at my nursery and at my garden center where they just, you know, they had a pickup and a shovel. You can call yourself a landscaper. It doesn't mean they do bad work. I'm not actually saying most of those guys, a lot of those guys are hustling and learning uh, and working hard at their craft every day, learning how to pronounce the names properly of the plants, and they're, they're really working at it. And they probably do a great job for you, and some of them don't care they're trying to get money by thursday <laughs> because they're going to the beach to go fishing on friday and, and it, unfortunately that's the truth how do you go about finding one you have to do it through someone else i mean you have you have to have a neighbor that had somebody work for them um, a lot of the landscape contractors here in the triangle have minimum you know that they'll work for so you know they've got seventy five hundred dollar job minimums five thousand dollar job minimums um, just because they're big companies and it takes a lot for them to move, you know, just to get to your job site, they've probably got $400 in it, you know, to load up materials, to shop and do all the things that they need to do to arrive. So, but if you need somebody to just do odd jobs, small things, um, I would get referrals uh, from, from folks. I would go on Facebook if you've got local Facebook friends and throw out the question. And a lot of them may throw back somebody that they know have some sort of personal relationship with uh, that can come over and help you with some of those things. There might be some people right now, I don't know, you know, as upside down as the world's been for the last 24 months that would, you know, come over and knock out some of these jobs um, just because they need, you know, they need the money. Um, but yeah, I think it's referral based mainly to find somebody who's reliable. Um, uh, but the system is really weird. I mean, you know, like I say, I went through a lot of testing, a lot, at, you know, a lot of professionalism in North Carolina certified landscape contractor bubble, but no one even knows that means anything. <laughs> the only the only law is that they regular landscapers can't call themselves landscape contractors. That's the whole law. <laughs> it's of no value to anyone to know that there are a group of us who, you know, uh, took it very very seriously um, and uh, and 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 you know whatever. But referrals. Um, made a long answer out of that, didn't I? Okay, um, somebody asked me if I'd be moving the old videos from this channel over to the new channel, uh, just the plant-based videos. No, I'm going to create all new ones. Um, I, I, I like the format that I'm using so far. I'm getting positive feedback on it. I'm going to continue with that. Um, and uh, there will be another set of videos over there once I build the channel out some that you guys will see of, of just groupings of plants like plants for foundations, plants for screening, plants for wet areas, plants that are deer resistant, whatever. So there is a second kind of video coming to that channel, but it'll be a little while. Uh, somebody asked me about how tall the tea, my tea olives were now. Uh, these are probably seven and a half feet or so. I can smell them right now. It's, it's 70 some degrees here on a Thursday, December 30th, it's so wild. It's supposed to go down to like 28 or 29 Saturday night. I mean, that's just still nothing. Uh, I think they're about seven and a half feet tall. They grew a lot this past year, but everything in this landscape grew a lot this past year with only a couple exceptions to that. And it's mostly due to the soil improvement if you've been following the, uh, following the channel. Uh, somebody asked me about service berry uh, rust or cedar apple rust. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, junipers and things in the rosaceae or the rose family um, share a disease called cedar apple rust. Um, there's no, uh, it's the eastern red cedar, uh, eastern red cedar, which is actually juniperus uh, virginiana. It's eastern, it's the, uh, it's a juniper. It's not actually a cedar. We have a lot of things we call cedar that aren't cedars. There's only a few actual cedars on the planet. Um, uh, but we call this juniper <laughs> an eastern red cedar. Uh, but it, it, with things in the rosaceae, which includes service berries, Indian hawthorns and roses and apples, 
Um, all of those things are in, in the rose family. Uh, and uh, uh, lots of things we like to eat, uh, actually. But they share a disease, especially if they're close together. Um, if this particular juniper and any rose are close together, they exchange this. This person just wanted to know if there's any way to do any prevention. Uh, I would definitely clean up around it, you know, all around your service berry, get up any leaves. Um, most years that it's going to be worse, it's going to be humid and uh, wet, uh, and, and that's going to make it worse. It typically doesn't kill the plant. It's unfortunate um, that there's no great answer for this, um, you know, and it's, uh, it doesn't really hurt the service berry, it just makes it unattractive and makes the berries kind of inedible. Uh, if you get the berries, get the berries as soon as they mature. On a good year, uh, get the berries as soon as they start to mature, because if you let them sit there even a day too long or one rain too long, you know, that rust, that rust will get them uh, pretty quick. There are copper fungicides that people spray um, and sulfur uh, that people spray. I don't know if they have actual any ongoing luck with them, uh, nor would I do it myself. I've got a service berry out front. If it happens, it happens. Um, you know, that's life. Uh, for those of you who are growing, um, who are looking at apples and crab apples and some other rose family items and don't want this to happen, there are resistant varieties of those that have been introduced. And so um, this is one of those things when people are introducing rose family things that they are looking for. Um, this uh, fungal issue that, that junipers, not cedars, uh, and, uh, and roses have together. Um, but anyway, not a great answer for you. Uh, let's see. Um, somebody, somebody wanted to know if my potted shrubs, and I have a lot of potted, uh, I have a lot of uh, container plants out here, uh, were anchored to the ground. I guess roots, you know, coming out of the bottom of the pot. That azalea probably is at this point rooted uh, to the pot. They were wondering if I was concerned about them flying about in a hurricane or something. We get a hurricane that can lift that azalea up. I, Jim won't be here for that. I'll be over in Tennessee <laughs> when the hurricane starts throwing that pot around. Uh, there are some things you do need to think through, and I've been I've lived through many uh, uh, hurricanes with with you know 90, 100 to up to 110 mile an hour winds. You do need to have things anchored down. But if it starts throwing that pot around, um, whew, I won't be anywhere near here. Uh, uh, I don't have any of my pots really fall over. My maple back there is unfortunately my contorted maple is in a bit of a that pot's a little narrow at the base, and it falls over occasionally. I'm eventually going to break it if I I'm going to change that pot out. There's actually going to be a video before spring of me up potting a few of the container plants into larger containers. I'll probably use a lot of the existing containers I have. I'll just bump things up into the next size uh, that they need. But that's, that's coming. But no, I don't think these pots are not a threat in any kind of storm other than like a tornado. But I mean, heck, my roof will be gone too. So that won't matter <laughs> probably at that point. But uh, uh, nothing's going to pick that pot up. If it's more than like a seven gallon, 10 gallon container. Nothing's going to pick that up. Uh, let's see. Um, somebody's got an old camellia um, high hat is the variety, which is probably irrelevant to the to the question. Um, that has some mite damage and uh, just doesn't look good in general. Um, it's an it's an older one. Wanted to know if they should cut it back hard. Yeah, I'd cut it back hard. Use some organic fertilizer on it here in late February. Make sure it's mulched well. Um, and you're probably doing all you can do on it. When I see mite stressed plants, spider mites, I usually think that the plant is under some sort of stress. And so whether that be that it was initially planted too deep, uh, whether or not roots are, you know, you know, wrapping around one another because it wasn't, the root ball wasn't broken up well when it was initially planted. Uh, maybe it stays too dry. Maybe it gets too much. I don't know. So, some sort of stress, usually, usually with spider mites, it's some sort of stress related thing that's making the plant vulnerable to spider mites. Spider mites are on this planet to eliminate stressed plants. Um, they don't get on healthy growing things. They get on things that need to be, that na you know, nature is kind of deeming that plant needs to go away. Um, and uh, so that's what the mites are doing. Uh, so um, there is some sort of additional stress. I don't know what that is, um, I, I've never, uh, you know, without seeing the plant. But yeah, I'd go after it hard, fertilize it, see when it flushes back out. If it does this again, maybe a plant that goes away from me, or I replant it somewhere else. 
you know, I just risk it, dig it up, move it somewhere else and see if it flushes out in the new place uh, healthier and happier. Okay, somebody asked me about using the painter's uh, paper that they roll out for painting um, when they paint inside your uh, house to protect the carpet and that kind of thing. Using that as a weed barrier, yeah, that'll, that would work fine. It's gonna be temporary, you know, because it's eventually going, that, it's going to break down. But of course, what I'm telling you about weed barriers, it's all temporary because weed seeds are gonna come down on top of your mulch anyway. So um, yeah, it's as good as anything and certainly uh, paper breaking down, you know, will feed the soil rather than, you know, being a plastic mess. And then last question for this week, somebody asked me if I have a dogwood um, in this landscape. And then someone had answered it below. Somebody's paying attention to the channel. I have a Chinese evergreen dogwood out front. It's quite beautiful. It'll be one of the videos on the garden plant channel soon because it's actually budded up uh, to flower. Beautiful, beautiful plant. It's non-invasive. So I know as soon as I say I have a Chinese dogwood instead of a native dogwood, it'll be more natives. Uh, it's it's non um it's, it's not invasive, it doesn't seed itself, and so um, it plays nice out here. Our eastern native dogwoods just have just collapsed, um, you know, everywhere uh, in people's landscapes. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, down there talk, uh, talking to Durr, and when I was doing uh, Durr's video, there are a few, um, there are a few uh, uh, Cornus Florida introductions that seem to be more resistant to some of the uh, some of the problems that they have now. So I may go come back around and try to plant uh, a native dogwood uh, in this landscape before it's over with. But for now, I have that Chinese uh, dogwood again, uh, non-invasive, and it's beautiful. It's evergreen. I mean, it's completely foliated out there. It's just absolutely beautiful. Look for that video on the uh, on the Garden Plants channel uh, within the next uh, week or two. Thank you guys for asking questions and participating on the Q&A videos and participating on both channels. Uh, the Garden Plants uh, with Jim Putnam channel has over 1,500 subscribers in a week and a half or something like that. So uh, thank you very much for that and uh, watching the videos and so on and so forth. Uh, Happy New Year. Thanks for watching.